Welcome to NT501, Pentecostal Explorations of the New Testament. In this initial lecture, we will be considering the question, what is the New Testament? Specifically, we'll examine its nature and purpose. Simply put, the New Testament is a collection of documents that begins with the story of the Jewish Messiah named Jesus and ends with the vision of the end of the ages, a new heaven and a new earth with this Jesus enthroned in a new Jerusalem. Between these extraordinary stories is the story of the emergence, life, and ministry of the early church, and a number of documents which reveal something of its internal struggles and successes through epistle, sermon, and commentary. It's clear that these documents have a particular perspective from which their stories are told, for they are documents of faith from the believing community for the believing community. They all share the unwavering conviction that in the purpose, person of Jesus, humankind has experienced its fullest and most significant revelation of God and his offer of salvation. This course is designed to introduce you to this most remarkable book. In this initial section, we'll look at the New Testament's content, its relationship to the Old Testament, its historical significance, its place in the life of the church, and its role in the life of the Pentecostal Church. Individually, each of these areas of exploration has its own unique contribution to make to an understanding of the New Testament. Now, the best place to begin a study like this is to become acquainted with the content of the New Testament itself. What does one find in looking into its pages? What kinds of literature is th are there? What does the collection itself tell its readers about the way it should be approached? Well, the first thing one notes when looking inside the New Testament is that it contains a remarkable amount of narrative. In fact, well over half of the contents of the New Testament is narrative in form. While more will be said about this topic later, at this point a brief definition of this literary style or genre is offered. Very simply put, a narrative is a story. Stories may be long or short. They can range from very brief tales, like a bedtime story, whether factual or fictional, to full-length accounts from novels to biographies to histories. Ordinarily, a story has a plot, events, characters, a setting, structure, narr a narrator, a point of view, an author implied to the text, and a reader implied to the text. It almost goes without saying that in most cases a story is intended to be heard or read in one sitting. Therefore, to ensure proper interpretations, narratives should be treated as wholes. Now, at least five of the books of the New Testament may, may be classified as narrative. These are the stories of Jesus' life, that is, the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the story of the early church, that is, the Acts of the Apostles. Now, while each of the Gospels tell the story of Jesus' life, they're not simply identical replicas of one another. In fact, each Gospel tells the story of Jesus from a different perspective. So much so that students of the Gospels have been amazed both by their similarities and their differences. Unfortunately, many new readers, and some old ones too, make the mistake of approaching the Gospels as though only one account existed, as if the four accounts were simply to be regarded as a pool of information about Jesus to be mined indiscriminately from time to time. But if there are four separate Gospels within the pages of the New Testament, and if they offer four distinct accounts of the life of Jesus, then they should each be allowed to tell their story before attempts are made to harmonize, conflate, or reconcile. For despite their differences, in each of these accounts is found something about Jesus' origins, his relationship to John the Baptist, his understanding of God, his anointing by the Holy Spirit, his followers, his ministry of word, that is, teaching and preaching, and deed, healings and exorcisms and miracles, about his passion, that is, his betrayal, suffering, and death, and his resurrection. These stories function as the foundation of all that follows them in the New Testament. These four stories are followed by the story of the early church, 
which takes the reader from the resurrection of Jesus to the unhindered preaching of the gospel in the heart of the Roman Empire, in Rome itself. Here it is learned that through men and women filled with the Holy Spirit, all that Jesus began to do and say continues to be done and said. Although Jesus' most intimate followers are commissioned to be his witnesses to those in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth, this mandate is not directly accomplished by the Twelve, but through men and women who enter the story later. Yet continuity with that earlier commission is provided through additional calls and the continual powerful ministry of the Holy Spirit. Nearly everything that follows the, church of the, er the, the story of the early church are the writings of individuals who in the midst of their ministerial activity find it necessary to write congregations and individuals about a variety of matters ranging from the return of Jesus to sexual immorality. The largest group of such writings are the 13 letters that bear the name of Paul. Beginning with the longest, that is Romans, and ending with the shortest, that is Philemon, the, the hearer learns, or the reader learns, about Paul and the many challenges that faced him, his co-workers, and his congregations. From the resurrection of Jesus, to the admonitions about the Christian life, from the ministry of the Holy Spirit, to words about sowing generously, from justification by faith, to words about husbands and wives, parents and children, masters and slaves, Paul sets forth his reflections about the implications of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection for the Christian community. Other voices are found next to Paul's, some whose identity is uncertain, like the author of Hebrews, some more prominent, James, Peter, and John, and others more obscure, like Jude. But through sermons, letters, and commentary, each of these documents seek to clarify encourage, admonish, or warn their respective readers about some particular aspect of the faith. The New Testament concludes with a vision of the early church, in, in the early church, a vision that sees the New Jerusalem. These words of prophecy given to John on Patmos are a revelation of Jesus Christ about what is seen, what is now, and what is to come. In this most sensual of New Testament books, which is filled with sights and smells and sounds and touch, the reader is, is invited to relativize his or her present suffering, persecution, and false teaching by viewing the present earthly experience from the vantage point of heaven itself. Now, Each of these categories of documents reveal something important about the nature of Christian life, belief, and practice. Each has gifts to give. All will be examined in the lessons ahead. Let's next uh, consider the New Testament's location in the canon. Not only is it clear that there are several categories of documents contained in the New Testament, but it's also obvious that the New Testament writings stand alongside the Jewish scriptures, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. The precise nature of the relationship between the Testaments has long been contested both in the church and the academy. One of the ways in which the relationship is sometimes explained is to give pride of place to the New Testament as the essential scripture. This approach can be detected at the popular level in the attitude of many students of scripture toward the Old Testament, where it can be seen as a bit of a hindrance rather than an aid in terms of spirituality. But it's also manifested by individuals or groups who have rejected the Old Testament outright. As, for example, a second century figure named Marcion did. Focus upon, focusing upon the tensions between the Testaments, Marcion went so far as to argue that Jesus himself rejected the Old Testament, sitting him, setting himself over against it in the uh, antitheses. You have heard it said, but I say to you. Believing that large portions of the New Testament had been contaminated by Jewish influence, Marcion proposed a New Testament canon consisting of parts of Luke and ten epistles of Paul. 
This denigrating the Old, Old Testament in terms of, in favor of the New Testament is also seen in the work of a New Testament scholar like Rudolf Bultmann, who rejected the Old Testament as scripture owing to its nationalistic limitations in and around Judaism. This attitude toward the Old Testament can also be seen in, to a slighter degree in the theological system known as dispensationalism, where large parts of the Old Testament are relevant only to Jewish readers and not to Christians. This even includes parts of the New Testament, like the Sermon on the Mount. Another way the relationship between the Testaments is sometimes explained is to give pride of place to the Old Testament. On this view, the Old Testament is not to be interpreted in the light of the New, but can and should be allowed to speak for itself. While it would be acknowledged the New Testament is important, the Old Testament has a certain theological priority over the New Testament and should be seen as the more dominant part of the canon. One sometimes sees this attitude in a theological system known as theonomy, where all the Old Testament laws are sought, uh, thought to be able to be lived out, and even within our own tradition, uh, there have been forms of New Testament Judaism that have sought to live out various sections of the Old Testament as well. However, despite any strengths that might be found in views which elevate one part of the canon over the other, they fail to convince owing to their disregard of the ways in which the Testaments do indeed stand together. Some of the more obvious and important points of continuity include Christology, where certain um, statements made about Jesus come to fruition in the New Testament. In terms of salvation history, which is significant not only in the Old Testament, but some have even argued that Luke Acts is a New Testament version of the Samuel King's tradition, or the Chronicler in his work. Typology, where something, certain events in the Old Testament are lifted up as types of God's salvific power. Already one finds the Exodus serving that purpose in Isaiah, uh, both in the, um, his, his words about the Assyrians and in his words about the Babylonians. And the Exodus motif will continue in the New Testament uh, as well. There is the promise and fulfillment. Those promises made in the Old Testament that clearly find their fulfillment in the New Testament. Others which have been unfulfilled even now and then there's a, the whole business of continuity and discontinuity between the Testaments. The next part of the lecture, we will look at the history of earliest Christianity. One of the ways to approach the New Testament has been approached is to try to construct the history of earliest Christianity, beginning with Paul, whose letters are earlier than the other documents we have in the, most of the New Testament, and building one's way to the latter parts of the New Testament. In this view, then, Paul has a certain priority over the others because he writes earlier. You also see this attitude in attempts to get at the historical Jesus. The idea that um, what the view of Jesus we have in the New Testament has been so theologized that one has to enter into critical examination of the New Testament to remove the various layers of theological accretion, if you will, to get back to the historical Jesus. There are those who are concerned with trying to figure out the earliest version of Christianity, and still others who use this method as a way of trying to identify early Christian communities. We're quite familiar with the community of Paul and those churches and people who are around him. But scholars have discovered that John has a group of churches around him called the Johannine community. That Matthew may even have written for a community of believers. All of this then would lead to an examination of the way in which there was unity and diversity in the early church. Unity around Jesus as Savior, diversity around the way in which people worshipped. We'll look at this later, but a quick example is the way in the book of Acts that Stephen essentially says of the temple, since Jesus has come, it's not needed. You can tear it down. But James, on the other hand, continues to go to temple and apparently uh, is part of the worship there. At one point, he can say to Paul, Behold how many of the brothers are zealous for the law. The next section of this lecture is devoted to the New Testament in the life of the church. 
Another vantage point from which to appreciate the New Testament is to say something about the way it's functioned in the life of the church. Owing to the limitation of space, only a few comments may be offered here. Clearly, one of the most significant roles of the New Testament is its place in worship. From very early on, it appears that the reading of the Bible, and the New Testament in particular, constituted a not insignificant part of the worship service. Hints of this practice are found already in Colossians 4.16 and 1 Thessalonians 5.27, where Paul instructs the congregations to exchange letters to be read. Explicit reference to the reading of the New Testament is found in the writing of Justin Martyr, who wrote a, a work called His First Apology in the middle of the 2nd century. It appears that the documents, that, that the documents, especially the Gospels and the Apostle, as Paul was called, were read continuously, that is, straight through. Evidence for this is found rather consistently in the early church. In addition to the reading of the New Testament, it was, along with the Old Testament, the subject of a number of sermons. The large number of sermons or homilies that survived from the early church indicate that preaching through New Testament books was a standard part of worship. And the preaching often was accompanied, so says one writer, with shouts of joy and approval and applause that often accompanied the sermon. The New Testament was also used in instruction for new converts, for prayers, like this, the Lord's Prayer, for the words of institution in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, in baptism, and in certain songs, for example, the Magnificat. The New Testament was not only heard, but it was also seen in the life of the church. A variety of scenes and stories became the basis for the work of countless Christian artists. In the Roman catacombs, for example, the anchor, dove, and fish are frequently found, while Lazarus' resurrection is found some 53 times itself. Jesus as a shepherd appears about 114 times in the catacombs. At one of the oldest house churches ever discovered, in Dura, Europus, about 240 CE, representations include the Good Shepherd, Peter walking on the water, and the Samaritan woman. Later, the influence of the New Testament on Christian art is found on coffins, in places of worship, cathedrals and chapels, and in the work of the masters. Artistic depictions are all the more important in context where illiteracy is high, and consequently these artistic depictions become a way of conveying the, the knowledge of Scripture to the masses. A final point in this initial lecture wants to reflect just briefly on the relationship between Pentecostalism and the New Testament. As Pentecostalism was a restorationist movement which sought to restore first century Christianity after some of the things had slipped away and been lost, would go to the New Testament constantly for instruction. Acts became the authoritative history and theology of the New Testament. And the Old Testament and New Testament began to be read through the lens of Acts itself. It also was read through Mark 16, 9 through 20, which becomes a litmus test almost for whether a group or a person were Pentecostals, whether the signs following existed in their lives or not. Early Pentecostals were known for their narrative approach to the Old Testament where mu and New Testament, where much of their preaching and teaching followed the narrative form itself. As Steve Land has said uh, in other contexts, uh, Pentecostals had a Pentecostal time machine, if you will, where they would be back with Abraham as he is offering Isaac, or they would be up on the mountain with Jesus and the disciples. Narrative preaching was a hallmark of early Pentecostalism, and in this regard, it very much matched the nature of the biblical text itself. There were a number of stories that emerge in early Pentecostal examinations of Scripture. The woman with the issue of blood, blind Bartimaeus, the stories of Elijah and David, the Exodus, Jacob at Penel, which becomes the defining Scripture for sanctification for many. The New Testament informed Pentecostal, as we mentioned earlier, Pentecostalism's worship, the whole notion of the move of spiritual gifts. 
It also underlies belief and practice and centers around Jesus as, as the center of the fivefold gospel, where Jesus is our Savior. He is our sanctifier. He is our spirit baptizer. He is our healer. He is our coming king. It is remarkable indeed how much of the New Testament revolves around one element of the fivefold or the other. And of course the practice of the early Pentecostal community, including things like anointing with oil and, and uh, other uh, specific aspects that arise from the text itself. Some of the primary texts for early Pentecostals are Matthew 25, the parable of the virgins, where Pentecostals nearly consistently saw this parable as representing their own time. The five foolish virgins would often be called good holiness people. Obviously they are pure. Obviously they love the Lord, but they don't have enough of the oil of the Spirit. Pentecostals, on the other hand, would see themselves as the recipients of Spirit baptism and not having that deficit. In the defense of Pentecostals in this interpretive approach, Matthew 25 is an eschatological text. The oil represents something. If it doesn't represent the Spirit and a good supply of the Spirit, what does it represent? It's a good hermeneutical question. But this parable appears in nearly every strand of early Pentecostalism, beginning with the apostolic faith, going through the bridegroom's messenger, being in the Pentecostal holiness advocate, and a number of finished work documents as well. We've already mentioned that Mark 16, 9 through 20, is one of the primary texts for early Pentecostalism. It is quite remarkable that this text takes a giant leap forward in citations when the Pentecostal movement comes. The 19th century healing movement, for example, very rarely cited Mark 16, but despite knowing of its textual questions and knowing that there were some manuscripts that omitted this portion of text, for Pentecostals it becomes the defining text. James 5 is another example of a text that shows up all over the place owing to its instructions for what to do when people are sick in the community. And still another text that is uh, found in as a very important text in early Pentecostalism is Jude 3. Believe it or not, the text that is on the masthead of the Azusa Street paper, The Apostolic Faith, is not Acts 2-4. It is not Mark 16, it is Jude 3, to earnestly contend for the faith. The faith, which for these early Pentecostal readers, was the fivefold gospel. Well, this lecture has been designed to help introduce you to how we're going to try to engage the New Testament. And in the days that come, and in the lessons that come, we will be looking at specific aspects of a number of these categories as we move forward.